Dear Amy, if ever there was anybody I would love to meet, it would be you. There is something about your life that moves me so very deeply. Yes, I would want to maintain that you were the greatest woman writer of Christian literature that Ireland has ever known. And yes, you did an incredible work in South India, saving thousands of children from cult prostitution. But it was your dedication to the Lord Jesus that I find so moving. You began serving the people of India in the year 1895, and you died in 1951 without a single furlough. You said a furlough was an exile. The Apostle Paul wrote about giving our lives as a living sacrifice, and you epitomize that beautifully. And that sacrifice you gave has been of incredible blessing in terms of its influence for Christ to millions. You were born, Amy, on the 16th of December, 1867, in the little county down village of Malal. Your great-grandfather had leased two flour mills in the area, and your father David and your uncle Robert were developing them. This area is very famous for one incident in your life. Your favorite color was always blue. You had, they say, liquid brown eyes. And when you were three years of age in this village, you had heard from your mother that Jesus always answered prayer. So, one day you got down on your knees and you asked God to change the color of your eyes to blue like your mother's. Next morning, you jumped on the chair and looked in the mirror, and as your famous poem of the incident said, where, oh, where could the blue eyes be? Not there, Jesus hadn't answered. And then the equally famous lines. Came a whisper, soft and low, Jesus answered. He said, no, and isn't no an answer? Decades later, you uncovered the incredible practice of cult prostitution from children who were sold into temples and with a mixture of rage in your heart and love in your heart you began to uncover the facts of this horrendous practice and I think it is important to say that one of the very first things the Indian government did after the British had left India, was to ban the practice. The great Gandhi was opposed to it. Many Hindus were opposed to it. But you uncovered it going on in your time. And in disguise, with your hands stained with tea stains and your sari on, you went into those temples to look for the facts. And of course, they never suspected that you were a European. Why? Because of your brown eyes. Those brown eyes were a godsend. And many years later, the story is told of someone perhaps a little jealous of how popular you were with those children with whom you were associated. This person had said to an Indian child, why do you really like this Irish missionary so much? And the little child said, because she's got the same color of eyes as we have. When God says no, there's a purpose with his no, an awesome purpose, as you discovered. As you grew up, you fearlessly rode your pony up and down the long beach in Malal. Once you were thrown and lay stunned by the sea wall and had to stay in bed for weeks. Then, of course, when you get up again, you were back on the pony and raking up and down this beach at Malal with your heart thumping and the sea wind blowing in your face. At your house here in Malal, you were once discovered climbing out of the skylight 
and going around the guttering of the house and you look down and there were your parents standing in the garden looking up at you. Later on, you said of yourself, these are not my words, these are your words. You said you were a wild bird child and in no wise tame. You often came here to Port of Ferry, Amy, where your grandmother lived and where your uncle was a local doctor by beautiful Strangford Loch, named by the Vikings, meaning violent ford. That refers to the Narrows, what are known here locally as the Narrows, which is the stretch of water between Port of Ferry here and Strangford over on the other side of the loch. At this narrow point, 35 million cubic meters of water come in every day to fill the loch. And the tides are said to be the second strongest in the world. They actually go at a speed of 7.5 knots. Not a safe place to be rowing for anyone, never to speak of children. You were allowed to row in the area and told not to go beyond a certain point. But the wild bird child did just that. And on one very famous occasion, you began to slip into the tide here in your boat and the tide began to drag you towards the bar mouth. And your life and the life of your brothers were in danger. One of your brothers said to you, sing something, Amy. So you sang the words of the hymn, he leadeth me, O blessed thought, O words with heavenly comfort fraught, where'er I am, where'er I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. And the local coast guards suddenly heard a teenage voice singing, looked out, saw the rowing boat, launched their boat and saved your lives. Eventually, Amy, you find yourself at a boarding school in Harrogate in England, where you described yourself as being like a wild bird child. The wide open spaces of North Down were deeply missed. You were a tomboy at that school, Amy, and there was a streak of a rebel in you. In the hand of God, you came under the wonderful influence of the CSSM, the Children's Special Service Mission, an organization through which I too found Christ. Towards the end of your time at boarding school, you were at a CSSM service taken by Edwin Arrowsmith, who asked the children to sing the words of the famous chorus, Jesus loves me, this I know. And then he asked the children to be quiet for a few moments. It was in those quiet moments that immeasurable love drew you into the safe keeping of Christ's fold. The Good Shepherd had called you to himself and right to the end of your life, you were to come to know that voice intimately and follow him closely. You put it this way, it is not far to go for thou art near. It is not far to go for thou art here and not by traveling Lord men come to thee but by the way of love, and we love thee. Back in Ireland, Demi, things were changing for you. Your father and your uncle decided to build a new mill at Dufferin Dock in the city of Belfast, and your family moved to a new tall house at number 21 College Gardens. Sadly, a dark shadow came into your life at this time. Your father actually caught a chill and at the end of the week, he died on a Sunday morning while the bells of the churches were ringing of double pneumonia. And you find yourself in a completely new role. 
You became a second mother to your family and you had one great quality in your life as an 18 year old. It was called empathy. You were constantly empathizing with people who were in trouble and an incident was about to happen in the city to you, which was to change the direction of your Christian life. Your brother said after it, you came back here to number 21 College Gardens and in prayer, you had dealings with God that were to affect the entire future direction of your life and service. On a dull, wet, grey Belfast morning, it was a Sunday morning, Amy, you were to be found coming home from church. When on the street you came across a poor old lady carrying a heavy bundle, you and your brothers took pity on her, went over and released her from her bundle and lifting her by the arms, you helped her along the road. Suddenly now, because you had changed your position, you were now facing people coming home from church and you spoke about their polite but surprised faces to see a Carmichael child doing what she was doing and you said you turned crimson. Later on, as you went further up the street, you talked about passing a fountain, reckoned to be this fountain outside the BBC here on Ormo Avenue in Belfast. And as you walked along the street, passing the fountain, suddenly through that gray drizzle, a powerful text of scripture came into your consciousness. That scripture about how that everybody's work one day will be tested as by fire, whether it will be of wood, hay, stubble or gold, and precious stones. You turned to see who had spoken it to you because it was so powerful in your consciousness, it was as though the verse had been spoken by a human voice, but everything seemed the same. And yet, it wasn't the same because you said that day, there was really nothing that mattered to you more than eternal things. That was the day you decided that eternal things were the most important thing to live for. If I may paraphrase it, I think that day as an 18 year old on the streets of Belfast, you became a missionary. Eventually, Amy, you took an incredible interest in the linen mill girls of this city. Linen coming out of Ireland was of course a huge industry in those days. All across the world, people used Irish linen and you took an interest in the girls who worked in these great mills. Many of them had to work in their bare feet. They were called shawlies because they couldn't afford the great Edwardian hats that many people wore in church. They wore shawls. And in the church hall of your local church, you got hundreds of them under the sound of the gospel. But you really felt that they needed a place of their own. So you worked very hard and raised the money to establish an iron hall in the Shankill area of Belfast and eventually that iron hall was erected here in Cambria Street and in 1887 on a very famous day you came to this building and your shawlies were gathered in a place of their own famously called the welcome And now, 120 years later, I am coming to the welcome, which is just about to reopen after a major refurbishment. It is now known as the Welcome Evangelical Church and is involved in a huge evangelical outreach in the 21st century in this area. This refurbished building is just about to be opened in a few days. Let's go inside and see what's happening.
must have been quite a day, Amy, when all those people gathered here at the Welcome Mission on that very first day at that very first service. And typical of you, you wouldn't sit on the platform with the special speakers. You sat down here in the body of the Welcome Mission. And that was typical of your life right to its very end. Epitomized by the text that you chose, which is here on the wall. And for this refurbishment, just in a few days time, this place will be reopened with a very special service in which dignitaries from across the city and Christians will gather. And again, they'll look up at the text that you put on this wall in 1887 that in all things he might have the preeminence. If any life ever had a text lived out, your life is that life. At 21 years of age, you set out to serve with the Manchester City Mission and the strain of overwork broke your health. A friend of your family, Mr. Robert Wilson, one of the founders of the Great Keswick Convention and the man who chose its famous motto, All One in Christ Jesus, invited you to his house at Brighton Grange, Brighton, near Cockermouth in Cumbria, to convalesce. A coal mine owner, he eventually unofficially adopted you and became an absolute anchor in your life, supporting your work to its end. It was there, Amy, at Brighton Grange in the Lake District as a 25-year-old woman one evening as the mantling snow began to fall. A momentous struggle began in your soul. You heard the direct call of God from the Scriptures again as a human voice almost. The two words as translated in the authorised version, go ye, and you knew what it meant. And the struggle was, of course, to leave your loved ones and to go far from home in the cause of Christ. But you obeyed, and away you went on a ship to Japan. On that stretch from Colombo to Japan, you were in a tiny rat-infested, cockroach-infested cabin. And the captain watched you and took pity on you and said to you, Miss Carmichael, you can sleep out on the deck if you wish. And so you slept out on the deck under the stars in the evening. And as that captain watched you night after night, day after day, live your Christian witness on that ship, he was so moved that the spiritual light began to penetrate the darkness of his life. And before the ship docked, in Japan, he had become a Christian. Eventually, after service in Japan and Sri Lanka, you were finally accepted for service in India on July 26th, 1895. On the following day, you spoke at a missionary meeting in the big tent of the Keswick Convention, unrolling a blue ribbon with the words, nothing too precious for Jesus, emblazoned on it. You served in India for 56 years, dying there, not only in it, but off it. You never returned to the United Kingdom. There are many things, Amy, that you accomplished for God in India, but certainly the huge turning point came on the evening of March 4th, 
1900. You believe that an angel came to a temple and took a little seven-year-old child called Prina by the hand and led her across a stream. A Christian woman found her in the woods, took her to her home for the night, intending to return her to the temple the next day. The little mite kept insisting she wanted to go to the one she called the child-catching mother. As you were having tea on the veranda at the mission bungalow early the next morning, you saw the woman coming with the little child. The child ran straight to you, climbed on your knee and said, my name is Pearl Eyes, and announced she had come to stay always. The little thing walked straight into our hearts, you wrote. When the temple woman eventually arrived to take Prina back, she refused to go, and no wonder. When she had escaped before and her mother returned her to the temple, they had branded her hands with hot irons as a punishment. So Prina stayed, and she became the first of a family of children who were to become legendary. From her, you learned things that, as you put it, darkened the sunlight. Children were sold to the temple women and were raised as cult prostitutes or, as the women put it, were married to a god. As I have already commented, all Hindu people were not for this practice by any means and the great Gandhi was very opposed to it. The Indian government, which was set up on independence from Britain, very quickly and with great courage banned the practice by law. You, Amy, though, in your circumstances, faced the problem head on. Eventually at Dunavar, in South India, you cared for thousands of these children. You painstakingly uncovered the facts. In reading your notes on what you found, Amy, my blood ran cold. You who had taught scripture to as many as 20,000 people at a Bible convention and had worked as an itinerant evangelist in South India, now began to give your whole life to rescuing and caring for these temple children at Dunavar. Your commitment was absolute. The strain of leading the work was immense. The loneliness of leadership was real. You rocked the boat of state the boat of the temples and even the missionary boat. Quite a movement arose among missionaries and Indian Christians to get Amy Carmichael out of India. You were accused of attempting to save temple children only as a stunt to draw attention to yourself. But on you went submitting the facts to the Raj as the British government of India was known. The horrors of cholera and disease taking away some of your children is palpable in your writing. It just broke your heart time after time. You and your dedicated team of workers cared for these thousands of children over those many years, Amy, leading many to faith in Christ, and you never asked publicly for a penny. During the First World War, Amy, you of course were aware of huge problems because much of the mail that was coming to you was lost because of enemy action. And one day you were sitting on a mountain when a little cloud came down and it began to rain on one field on the plain below you when the rest of the fields were left in glowing sunshine. And basically, you asked the Lord if he would do that for you, metaphorically speaking. You asked him if in the meal every day for the rest of that war period, something could come to support the work that you were doing. And of course, it happened. The very next day, something arrived in the meal to help you. And for every single day of the rest of that war period. And I love how you said, if if those who had been supporting you could have seen the, the untidy mess that the post office was and the unangelic postman through whose hands the mail was passing, 
they would not have believed what was happening. What an amazing thing. You called it the wonder story. Another little story out of your life always moves me very deeply. I mean, of a Keswick Convention Bible teacher who visited India and who knew you from the past and came to see you. And one day he called you by your name. He said, Amy. And you said later, it was lovely to hear the old name again. Amazing. You had lost your very personal identity in the cause of Christ. You were, of course, called Emma, mother by those around you, and not Amy. What a living sacrifice your life was. After lots of adventures in the service of Christ, one evening in 1931, you fell into an unlit toilet borehole. You twisted your spine and became an invalid for the next 21 years of your life. I have corresponded with your doctor and she tells me that you were confined to one room, able only to reach the veranda. Yet those years were not wasted. From that room, an outstanding creativity began to flow. On the door outside your room, on light teak wood was written these words, the room of peace. From it flowed books, thousands of personal letters and hundreds of songs and poems to touch countless people across the world. If anything, your international influence after you fell into that hole was even greater than before. You maintained that whatever circumstance God moves us into, if we live for Christ in it, the gift we give or the prayer we make or the letter we write has the unbound Christ in it and can be an incredible blessing way beyond our understanding. You went to be with Christ early in the morning of January 18th, 1951 at Dunover with your loved ones around you. You called yourself a wild bird child. And it is fitting that your grave at Dunover is marked by a bird bath. Today at Dunover, the leadership of the work has, at your wish, now passed into Indian hands. In the hospital, there are pathological and biochemical laboratories, an extensive pharmacy, an operating theater, and dental services. Three doctors see three to four hundred patients per day. Now only girls are taken by the Dunavar Fellowship. If not, many would have been victims of infanticide. They are taught in school to Standard 5 in the Dunavar compound and then move on to other Christian boarding schools in the district. On the campus of what was once the Dunavar Home for Boys, a wonderful new boarding school for missionaries children, is now at full vigor. Children from 23 Indian states now attend the school. You, of course, wrote 37 books in all, and their influence is simply inestimable. I give God all the glory for your amazing life, Amy. It's very important that we give him all the glory. When the great William Wilberforce stood before the British House of Commons and pled with the British government in a very moving speech to allow Christian missionaries into India, he won the day and the door was opened for you eventually the child rescuing Christian missionary, social reformer and writer. And yet there is one thing I am really looking forward to, Amy. It is to meeting you and your children in heaven. We are told that there 
They will be gathered from every tongue and every tribe and every nation. It will be wonderful to meet you. And yet, and yet somehow your Christian life and witness is still near us, pointing upward, you being dead, yet speak.